glue stick on resin printers, Prusa MK4s that have really bad bed adhesion for really odd reasons, and how not to change a nozzle on a Solval SV06+. Plus. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 110. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're dealing with some printer problems, you are more than welcome to hit us up. Links are in that description down below where we will help you get back to printing with purpose. And hey, if you are here getting some help, make sure to leave a like and get subscribed if you're not. And you know, hey, if you're just here to hang out and watch the video, you know where those buttons are too. They like it. We have some interesting fails coming up for you guys today. Some ones that have, to me, some more obvious issues and failures than others, but that doesn't mean that these issues are any less important. Without further ado, let's jump right into the first one where uh, we always say it's not wet filament, but this time it's not ringing. Is this considered ringing? Why would it only show up on lower layers? So it looks like we've got a pumpkin here, uh, you know, reasonably festive this time of year. It's Ender 3 V2 Neo with a Sonic Pad, CR Silk 1.75 at 200 C. So this is not ringing. But what we can see is just some issues with our overhangs and up here an issue with our Z seam. Ringing will look like kind of a ghosting effect where the curve or the edge will continue to show up in a flat wall. Uh, it's a very common thing that you see in printers that are running too fast or with too high acceleration. Printers like the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon, which of course we've looked at quite a few times, the GTEC X Plus 3, which we recently looked at, we'll card to that video so you guys can take a look, and Vorons, among many other machines out there, all have what is called input shaping. And input shaping is that active noise canceling that we've talked about in the past for your 3D printer so that the vibrations that it makes, it can actually counteract them. The clipper pad or the sonic pad is a pad that is running some modified version of clipper and that would allow your ender to go really fast because it could theoretically run input shaper. However, without the right proper input shaping device, which is an accelerometer, you're going to be guessing and it's not gonna really work out the way that you want. In this particular case though, it's none of that. See, if we're running very, very fast and we're running silk, this is pretty much expected. Silk shrinks a lot when it cools down. And so it has a tendency to actually warp. You know, when you purge silk out of your hot end, it will, you know, come down and that it will suck back up. That's not because it's Ritz retracting back into the hot end. It's because the material itself is actually contracting. How do I know this? Well, recently I was at Printed Solid and we made some Jesse Elixir Silver. And if Dave lets me choose the name, I'm gonna call it Silver Fox, but I don't think Dave is gonna let me choose the name. But we actually have quite a few rolls of these and we'll be giving them away in an upcoming live stream. So stay tuned for that. And next week or two, you'll actually see the process of what it took to make this filament. The shine, at least in Elixir, is actually TPU and it takes the color from being what is a very dark dull gray to being a really really shiny silver that ends up looking beautiful and that's what we're seeing here. The problem with silk though is that if you don't cool it down fast and it takes more time to cool down, it will actually shrink more. See, part of the cooling fans that you have on your machine is to lock the filament where it is right then and there. And that locking of the filament ensures that it doesn't move. If you're moving too fast, you're not cooling it down enough and therefore it's gonna start curling on the edges. We also have some Z seam issue up here and that's gonna be your retraction and de-retraction. And for a part like this, you shouldn't have any D retraction or any Z seam, really, at least not that big. So I would look at trying to figure out what your retraction, D retraction settings are, as well as any uh, perimeter overlap that you have for the exterior perimeter to try to reduce that artifact that we see. I don't see any ringing, but we do see a couple of lines of under extrusion. 200C, 
for a printer that is running a Sonic pad, if you are running it fast, might actually be a little bit too cold for this material. So do a little bit of due diligence there and mess around with temperatures. Silk can be really, really picky, especially depending on what type of colorant and additives that the companies add in there to give it the shine. At least the good stuff, you know, actual polyalchemy elixir. Yes, this is real polyalchemy elixir. You'll see in the video, don't worry. This is TPU that makes it shiny, but other companies might use other things. But as for ringing, it's not this. This is not ringing. This is poor overhang and poor Z-seam, which I feel like we should do a Z-seam video. Maybe an overhang video too. Although those are both very printer specific. I don't know. I would love to do something like that, but I think logistically it sounds a little complicated. If you guys have any ideas as to how we could do a video on it and teach people how to do it better, let me know, because I have a feeling that one is going to be a lot harder to kind of teach people than some of the other back to basics things that we've done before and have planned. Prints won't stick to build plate. We've got an image of primer for your resin. We have an individual that just got into 3D printing for businesses. They picked up a Mars 4 Max and they tried printing, but they're having trouble. The print does not stick to the build plate. They're using Elmer's glue stick. What? I know it's because of the glue, because after waiting for the print to finish, I see that the supports are only made. Today I saw that my print was only partially built. I saw a video on YouTube where a guy showed what he uses. It costs $10, but $30 to ship, and I don't want to pay that. Any suggestions on what to use? Thanks in advance. I had to check to make sure I was in the resin printing subreddit because glue stick does not belong on resin printers. In fact, you should not have any additives for your resin printer build plate adhesion. Glue is used primarily in the computer controlled hot glue gun, not the high detail resin. And yeah, that's gonna really contaminate your resin. Now, I don't know to what extent, I'm not a chemist. I don't really understand that stuff too deep other than knowing that resin is toxic and you need to wear proper PPE when dealing with resin. We went over this a while back in a video. We'll card to it so you guys can take a look. And uh, yeah, don't, don't put glue stick or any additives. I know back in the day there were talks, and even we did it, where you would oil your FEP with a PTFE oil, and then you would clean it off, and it would theoretically create a film that would keep your parts from sticking. It was, I mean, I would say it was snake oil, but at least I've got a couple of bottles of PTFE lube laying around that I could use to lubricate bearings and motion systems and squeaky tools and that kind of thing. Uh, glue is not the right move. And if you're having adhesion issues to your build plate, you need to look at running the cones of calibration. We've talked with Ty from Table Flip Foundry in the past and... It, TLDR, the cones are awesome, and it is really, really easy to dial in your resin printer. It's about a 40-minute print or less, and the new cones are really good at helping you get this dialed in very quickly. With that being said, you probably are going to need to throw away the resin that you have. When we are talking about stuff on the build plate, the only thing that I would ever even remotely recommend to go on a build plate is something like a wham bam flex plate or some sort of good quality flex plate so that it is easier to get your parts off. But if you're doing small jewelry, you're probably not too worried about that. We do personally sand our build plates down, but that's because we use OG Elegoo Marses. I still have one in the box. That's how long these things last because we have so many many and generally we don't get the same stuff all the time so a lot of times these printers end up sitting so we actually sand those build plates to increase their surface area now a lot of plates are coming lasered with a fiber laser to give you that extra surface area so you might not need to do that but if you do go down that route please 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 make sure you really clean off that build plate an ultrasonic cleaner is a great way to do that as well as wiping it down with lots of isopropyl alcohol because you don't want those metal particulates getting into your resin. And if you are in the jewelry business, because I don't know, the ads plus 
the video kind of tells me you might be in the jewelry business. Look at Soraya Tech Cast. It's a purple wax based resin. We use it here. We absolutely love it. It prints really, really easily. And I think really the only downside to it is it is hygroscopic. It absorbs water. So you can't clean it in traditional like water based cleaning systems. You have to use alcohol and you have to let it dry really, really well before you go ahead and cure it or you risk having issues during the burnout process. But with that being said, you do not want to use glue stick on your printer. That is uh, not the right idea. You don't want to use any additives if you can avoid it. And if your parts are not sticking still after the glue is removed and cleaned and all of that, your cure time, your first few layer cure time is probably too low and upping that a couple of seconds might help. With that being said, run the cones of calibration. It will help you better understand it. And Ty from Table Flip Foundry does an amazing job describing how they work, why they work, and why they're just so darn good and so simple to use. So we'll link to that and we'll link to the cones in the description down below so you guys can go get it if that's something you're looking for. But please don't do that with resin printers. And remember that resin is toxic. Please don't hurt yourself either. Moving on. PLA not sticking anymore. Residue from recycled PLA on PEI. Tried most of cleaning advice what to do. We have got a Prusa MK4, actually a brand new printer that we don't have yet. If you guys would like us to get an MK4, let me know and maybe we'll uh, see if we can make that happen. But our XL pre-order just came up, so I think I'm putting some cash toward that. We can see that there is some residue here. There's definitely something left on the bed, but that's not normally something to be concerned about. I would have really preferred to see more photos than just this. Uh, we can see that they've tried some different things. They've cleaned with alcohol. They only have 70% on hand, hot water and dish soap and brake cleaner, which is not something that I recommend that you clean your build plate with, but hey, whatever. Uh, and it is a relatively new printer. They printed a few small things, high quality PLA, which is red line filament. I have never heard of them and they had no problem. Then they started a larger project and printed about four to five kilos of recycled PLA. And now that they're done with that, the high quality PLA won't stick anymore. Interestingly enough, the recycled PLA sticks. The high quality PLA sticks without issue on the other side of the sheet. So yeah, there is likely some sort of contaminant that is ending up on the build plate here. Now, Prusa does recommend to revitalize these plates to use acetone, but you do wanna be careful because acetone is only good on the smooth plate. If you look at putting acetone on other plates, it can damage it. So be careful and follow directions from Prusa. For us, between every print, we wipe down with Windex. It's been something that we've always done, I don't know if it helps, but what I do know is it doesn't hurt. And we get pretty good sticking for our prints. Now, some of our build plates are starting to get a little old and that's when I will take them off. I'll put some alcohol, a little bit of water on there as well. And then I will sand it with anywhere between 2000 and 5000 grit sandpaper, very light Mr. Miyagi style sanding right. oh. just to give it more surface area. Similar to what we would do with resin, it works the same way here. You could also use quadruple aught steel wool, that's four zeros. Or if you really wanted to go this route, you could even look at something like a, a magic eraser or melamine foam. It's the same thing, I believe. And uh, that should help revitalize it as well. Brake clean is something that I would be cautious of. I don't think it's going to damage PEI, but you know, just be careful. Couple of wipes with acetone though, and life should be good. I wouldn't worry about it too much. And have any of you dealt with this problem? Let me know in those comments because I've never had an issue where I go between filaments and then all of a sudden one type of material sticks and now the other type of material doesn't. I'd love to know if you've experienced this and I would guess it's something inside of that recycled PLA that is leaving something, some sort of trace element or contaminant on the build plate that the regular PLA doesn't like to stick to. I would love to know your thoughts. How f***ed am I? Sovol SV06 Plus. Uh, yep, the answer is just yes. Any idea of how I could remove it? Do I need a left-handed bolt removal tool? 
nozzle from the solvo broke off when I tried removing. I think I'm giving up on 3D printing. Constant clogs, bed adhesion is terrible, power supply broke, and a slew of other problems. Did I just get a dud from them? Does anyone else have these issues with the SB06 Plus, or am I at fault? Well, we've got a bit of a problem here. So we have an SB06 Plus, which we have looked at. I do really like mine. Love my SV06 and the SV06 Plus. We call them poverty Prusas here at the shop because they're pretty darn close to a Prusa MK3S. And for the type of money that you're spending on the Soval, it's a good deal from my experience. We'll card to that unboxing stream if you guys want to take a look. This is from trying to loosen your nozzle when your hot end is still cold. You can't do that. So the reason why everything has to happen under heat is because when you heat metals, they expand. And that little bit of expansion is enough to allow the threads to go in and out relatively easily without damage. Yes, you will need a bolt extractor to get this out. A regular bolt extractor will be fine and you will need to heat up the printer. The other thing to take note of is, this is just to be safe, you'll wanna put a pair of pliers around the hot end block as well so that you don't end up shearing off the hot end block from the heat break. That would just cause you more problems. You will need a bolt extractor. Now you might get lucky and be able to like shove a screwdriver in and turn it, but if you have a set of bolt extractors, it's certainly not going to hurt. Alternatively, you can just try to run a screw into it when it's cold, heat it up and back out the screw. I, we've seen some jank ways to do it, but if you don't mind spending the money, a bolt extractor is likely the best way to do it. Something that worries me here is that they've had constant clogs and I'm not entirely certain how that happens because I don't find clogs are that big of a deal anymore. Remember, don't be cheap in this industry. I understand that you want to save some money, but don't just buy the cheapest filament that you can. And if you're running something like wood fill, cause like, I don't know about y'all, but that almost looks like wood fill. And if it's not wood fill, it looks damn close to it. Then yeah, you're probably going to get some clogs and you also probably shouldn't run wood fill on a brass nozzle. While it probably won't damage it too much, it, it will eventually wear it out faster than regular material. I don't think that clogs are gonna be on the manufacturer. I think that's gonna be more of the area of which you are printing in. You know, do you have a lot of issues with dust, debris, grime, grit, whatever? Or is it particularly windy, right? Do you have a lot of breeze going by that could cause one side of the nozzle to get much colder than the other side? It's probably unlikely, but better to mention it and, you know, for it not to be. Bed adhesion, and clogs like this user says are mostly user error. And the thing with textured build plates, because the SV06 Plus has a textured build plate, you need to be closer than you think. Normally people want glass-like first layers, but that really only applies when you're printing on a smooth surface. When you're printing on a textured surface, you want to be into the grooves, man. You gotta be in the groove, man. And to do that, you have to get that nozzle a little bit closer. It will mean that it might look like you're potentially scraping along the build plate or you have some peaks in between the lines. You can dial that in to fit what works well, but that's been my experience with the SV06 Plus. It seems to work okay. As far as the dead PSU, that's likely the company. And while they did heat up the nozzle before removing, you need to really heat it up. Like, 280 degrees, but that is only because the SV06 Plus is an all metal hot end. If it is not an all metal hot end, if you have a machine without an all metal hot end, you want to make sure that you heat it up to like no more than 250 because any hotter than that, you start risking damaging that PTFE liner. There's another thing that I'm a little worried about. They're going to look at AliExpress. Stop looking AliExpress for printer parts. Go buy decent parts. Either buy them direct from Sobel, which, okay, I get it, probably from AliExpress, or just go to Amazon. Spend a couple extra bucks and get it in two to three days versus two to three weeks. That way you can be back up and running and, you know, enjoying this hobby rather than just kind of, well, cussing at it like we've seen here. And they were trying everything for the adhesion and clogs, temperature changes, Z height, alcohol wipe down. I get it, it can be frustrating. I don't know if you have gotten any further in solving the problem. And while yes, this is the correct 
setup for that machine. You don't need the heater and the thermistor anymore, but if you do want to replace the whole thing, I am uh, certainly not going to fight you on that. Something to also note when loosening nozzles. They're saying lefty loosey. Yes, that's correct. But you have to imagine that you are looking from underneath the nozzle, right? Because here, left is this way, but underneath the nozzle, well, I guess that's still accurate now, isn't it? You just have to remember on the nozzle that you're working from underneath. So make sure that Lefty Lucy is actually Lefty Lucy and that you are going in that correct orientation. And I know that the nozzle for the SV06 Plus is a not Kano. It's a knockoff Volcano. Uh, but just still something to be aware of. And at this point, you don't have to replace the entire hot end. Simply a new nozzle will get the job done. But I know for the cost of easy outs or, you know, bolt extractors, you could probably just buy a whole new hot end. So there's that. Now you get spare parts you can hold on to for the next time something goes wrong. Because that's the thing. These machines are not guarantees. They take time. It can be frustrating but uh, that's what we're here for. We're, we try to help users like you get back to printing with purpose by going through these videos now like 110 weeks deep. What a time for a power cut. That's taken a big L on the print. Look at how close we were. Absolutely beautiful resin print right up until the end. Honestly, given that this looks like some sort of military vehicle, I would likely print out the part that they're missing and just, you know, do my best to put it in and glue it and kind of paint it and all that. But for resin printers, you don't need a very large battery backup. And we've said it before, I will say it again, battery backups are key. You gotta have them. It's cheap insurance. Even like a decent 1500 volt amp is gonna run you like sub 200 bucks. I know it's not pure sine wave. Your printers don't care. They use switch mode power supplies. They literally don't care. These aren't, you know, hospital grade machines. You can use a regular square wave battery backup. You'll be fine. And if that would have saved, honestly, it probably could have finished the rest of that on a battery because most smaller resin printers only draw like 50 to 60 watts. They don't even draw a ton of power. That would have likely protected you when you needed it and saved you from some of the BS that you're about to go through. Sure, you could look at redoing the print, but honestly, it ain't worth it. Hell, you could go through with some clippers and clean up the front and make it all kind of scraggly and call it battle damaged. There's always options, especially when it's for miniatures and that kind of thing. It's battle damaged. It's not a failed print. It's battle damaged. Remember, it's all about perspective. But yeah, man, battery backups are so freaking cheap. Don't don't put yourself through this if you don't have to. And a fail that I've been dealing with on the Chidi Tech X Plus 3. I have an email out to Chidi Tech. We're waiting to hear back from them. But I have been dealing with this one here. MCU MKS underscore THR shutdown. Timer too close. This often indicates the host computer is overloaded. So uh, does, does that mean that like the CPU in the printer is bogged down, and not working properly? Like, I don't have any experience with Clipper, so this is one of those error messages that I don't understand. This printer's been in my garage since we unboxed it last week. It's been seasonably cold here. I mean, it's been getting down into the 50s at night, which for Florida is very cold. Uh, and it was like 74 Fahrenheit today is the high, which is pretty good. And as you can see, it's about 21C right now close to 9 p.m. at night. And uh, yeah, for some reason, she's getting a little angry and I'm not entirely sure why, so we're gonna be reaching out to Chidi Tech about that. The other problem that I'm having is it's not flashing the firmware. Um, we have you know, followed all the instructions for the firmware process and for some reason, that doesn't wanna work either, but I have a feeling these two things might be related. Some users were showing that there were some bad boards that went out, the MKS boards. So maybe that's what we have as well. We'll see, but it's something that I wanted to mention that even in a review unit, this unit was sent to me free of charge. It's clearly not a golden unit, can tell you that much, but hey, that's the way it goes sometimes with these machines. You win some, you lose some, and I'm excited to learn more about how to fix it. I just don't want this to continue to ruin my prints. Also, you know, cause I found this one out the hard way, the filament runout sensor on the Chidi Tech X Plus 3 by factory default on the default firmware is set to off. Turn that on so you don't run out of filament like I did.
because you know the filament is on the back side of the printer inside of an enclosure where you can't see it cheaty seriously that's a freaking fail y'all got to do better about where you're putting your usb drives and your filament spools nobody accesses the back of their printers like this like i maybe if you're in a farm but if i have a row of printers i'm butting them up back to back i'm not gonna have access to the back sides of these printers but I digress. Anyways, that's the thing I'm dealing with. Clipper is still something that I've obviously got some growing pains in. And if you have any advice, I'd love to get it. But I do want to give a huge shout out to all of our channel supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Thank you for what you all do in making these episodes possible. Now, 110 episodes deep of Print Fix Friday. Remember, if you want to get help, you can reach out to us. All the social media links are in that description down below. And we'll do our best to help you getting back to printing with purpose. Right below me will be the entire Print Fix Friday series where you can take a look at some other veils and how we fix them. And hey, there are some joke ones in there too. Right next to that will be our coverage of the East Coast Rep Festival slash 3D Printopia 2023. So go take a look at those videos. I think you all will enjoy it. That's all I have for you guys today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.